Well, thank you, first of all, and thank you for inviting me uh, for an opportunity to speak to you. I'm going to start out by, first of all, telling you very humbly, I'm only going to speak about the U.S. I don't pretend to know things uh, or speak about things that I don't know as much about or Europe or so forth. I do congratulate Ireland, though. I understand that you celebrated a little bit earlier today on uh, some very important economic events uh, that were, uh, after many years of adjustment, uh, were able to finally bring to a close. And in a sense, that's what I'm going to speak about in terms of the United States. And my issues with uh, <clears throat> the issue of structure, I should say, uh, it is important in the U.S., um, and I know it's important globally, but I think it's extremely important that we not um, think we have everything solved when we've made certain changes and things are settling out when fundamental structural issues remain. And that's really the theme that I'm going to talk about here. It is a fact uh, that in the United States, as elsewhere, but over several years preceding the economic crisis, the U.S. financial safety net of deposit insurance that was in place then, Federal Reserve lending, and Treasury direct investment was expanded to include activities far beyond the core business of commercial banking. The effect was to erode the very economic stability being sought by these tools. More disturbing, however, is that the weakened financial structure and the crisis that followed these changes made it necessary for policymakers during that crisis to do whatever it takes to stabilize a system on the brink of collapse. Within the boundaries of the safety net, the government provided enormous amounts of money and guarantees and arranged and financed numerous mergers and buyouts in the United States in its effort to save a struggling industry and a global economy. It is no coincidence, therefore, that these events coincided with the evolution of an industry that is far more concentrated now, more complex now, and government dependent than at any time in recent history. In 1990, for example, the five largest U.S. financial holding companies controlled only 20% of the total industry assets. Today, that number is 55% and will likely increase, and I know it is larger in Europe than that. Ironically, these events also have left the U.S. economy increasingly vulnerable to the industry's mistakes. For example, the single largest financial holding company in the U.S. using international accounting standards now holds more than $4 trillion of assets, which is the equivalent of 25% of our GDP. The eight largest U.S. global systemically important banks, or GSIBs, hold in tandem nearly $15 trillion of assets or the equivalent of 90% of our GDP. Thus, whether resolved under a bankruptcy or otherwise, problem institutions of this influence will have a systemic consequence and affect far more stock stakeholders than simply the firms and their shareholders and their creditors. The ability of ever more concentrated and complex financing firms to conduct a broad array of activities while the government backstops their mistakes remains, therefore, a generous subsidy in the U.S. Over time, it most certainly undermines market discipline, distorts firm behavior, and in the long term, slows economic growth. It protects some creditors and creates a moral hazard problem within the financial markets and it bestows a competitive advantage to one segment of the financial industry over another. Thus, the benefits that the economy might receive from subsidizing this banking structure are often outweighed by the negative effects that eventually are borne by other sectors of the economy and the public. So it's with this in mind that I will briefly review some of the principal benefits that I think would likely flow from, to a host of stakeholders if the safety net was scaled back in the United States and the structure of banking industry was rationalized around essential core functions. So how would I do it very quickly? Uh, I would begin by briefly defining this. First, commercial banking organizations that are afforded access to the safety net would only be permitted to conduct the following types of activities. 
commercial banking, which is the intermediation of short-term deposits to assets, certain securities underwriting and advisory services, asset wealth management. Other underwriting, market making, broker dealer activities would be conducted outside the firm that hold a commercial banking charter and thus outside the safety net. Second, the so-called shadow banking system in the United States and its use of bank-like funding to intermediate long-term assets would be reformed and subject to far greater market discipline itself. So the proposal, which is actually uh, on the internet at the FDIC, recognizes that recent and proposed regulatory actions such as the Volcker Rule serve to lessen the moral hazard issues and the misaligned incentives that contributed to the recent financial crisis. However, while useful, they do not fully separate the host of trading and market-making activities of broker-dealers from the bank holding company and the overarching benefit of the safety net that flows to them. The fundamental restructuring I propose would more fully address this problem. It would separate complex financial firms along business lines and into separate corporate entities where directors have clear missions that are not confused. It would unequivocally preclude bank holding companies from engaging in activities that are distorted when they receive such subsidy coverage and would impede the use of excess leverage and the funding of such activities over time. So in the end, separating commercial banks and broker dealers would benefit all parties affected by the conduct of complex firms, including the public, the broader banking and financial industry, institutional borrowers, and the very firms that were at the center of the crisis. While any reform involves trade-offs, the benefits of subjecting a highly subsidized and artificially created system of complex firms to the forces of the market and away from government dependency I think deserves a healthy discussion. So let me, let me just describe how I think the benefits would fall to each of the groups. And I'm going to start with the, with the financial conglomerates themselves, the largest. There is, I think, increasing evidence that the largest, most complex firms would benefit from a structural changes outlined above. These conglomerates control assets in the trillions of dollars, as I noted, and involve structures that include thousands of subsidiaries, complex and varied activities with significant risk, and hundreds of thousands of people. Firms with these characteristics inevitably suffer serious financial setbacks as their leadership cannot manage their culture and because individuals within the firm too easily circumvent overly complex and centralized control systems. Managing them requires enormous amounts of information, knowledge, and skills to test any CEO's capacity to do so. The constant drumbeat of scandal and mediocre performance of the past half decade suggests that some financial firms have reached that point where they are too large and complicated to be led successfully. Management dis diseconomies appear to be overwhelming the economies of scope and scale. Unfortunately, in an environment in which the safety net protects these firms from outright failure, there is limited outside discipline or other mechanisms to right-size the firms, and as a result, market inefficiencies multiply. So confining the safety net and statutorily separating activities along business lines would make the largest financial conglomerates more manageable it would enhance the market role in disciplined behavior. It would require simpler and more reliable control systems, and should management fail on its job, the firms could be resolved more successfully. No firm can survive incompetent management. However, those firms where a competent CEO, it, his, his or her span of control is consistent with the demands of the day, are far more likely to achieve consistent performance over time. The market and its pricing of these firms also seem to be signaling this conclusion. Some of the largest banks have earned poorly over the past decade as they have dealt with the host of asset and performance problems. Some of the largest, most complex firms are trading at a discount from book value, suggesting that the market is not confident in their future performance. Market analysts are publishing reports suggesting the value of some of these companies would be greater if they were broken up. Should the performance of these largest firms continue to show substandard results, market pressure to simplify their structure will almost certainly increase 
as we're witnessing in the United States at least. There is, of course, strong disagreement with this view from those managing these largest firms, understandably, but nevertheless, their firm's performance through the crisis and its aftermath and their reliance on the safety net raise legitimate questions as to the role of such conglomerates in the future. What about the industrial companies that they, that they lend to or that rely on them? It is argued often that large industrial companies require large, highly complex financial firms to meet their global credit needs. Having single banking firm as its and its resources immediately available to meet global payments and credit requirements is an invaluable resource, it is said at least. This argument continues that financial conglomerates also serve the role of counterparty for hedging transactions or interest swaps to assure reliable cash flows to industrial companies. However, the chart titled Consolidation of the Credit Channel, which I have in your, hand, in your handout, shows how overstated this story is. In 1984, the aggregate distribution of assets among four size groups of U.S. banks ranging from less than a billion dollars to more than $100 billion was nearly equally aligned. Some differences, but much closer than uh, people realized. This changed dramatically over the next three decades to where the overwhelming control of resources now lies with the fewest mega banks. To suggest that this redistribution of assets among domestic financial firms has served a greater international competitive purpose or enhanced individual economic interest is to deny the events of the last five years, in my opinion. In private, many of the CEOs of these industrial companies indicate that they do not want to be dependent on a single banking firm for all their financing needs. They are aware that during the crisis, credit lines were too often pulled without regard to the need or length of the credit relationship. In the United States, the Alliance for American Manufacturing has noted that commercial and industrial loans declined from 1.6 trillion in 2008 to 1.2 trillion in 2011, and it suggests that this represents not only a decline in demand, but also a significant decline in the supply of credit. In reporting this figure, the Alliance added that before the advent of the conglomerate financial firms and their control of such vast resources, Capital markets were the servants of manufacturing companies, whereas today they are the masters. The fact that one industry is so widely expressing its frustration, I think, is worth taking note of. Economic theory and practice suggest that institutional borrowers and businesses benefit from a highly competitive market. For decades, in the United States at least, a decentralized commercial banking system provided payment services and individual or syndicated credit services to industrial companies with vast global operations. Investment banks successfully provided to these same firms underwriting and market making services and engaged in trading activities, all without the safety net subsidizing their operations, by the way. These activities were also conducted with far fewer conflicts of interest than witnessed since the merging of commercial banking and broker dealer activities inside the safety net in the United States beginning at the, in, the, in the 90s. Given the experience and market evidence following from the most recent crisis, there is a strong case that the business and institutional client would benefit from a less subsidized and more competitive, more specialized, more market-driven structure than that which brought forward the Great Recession. Let me talk about the independent broker dealers and enhanced competition that I'm talking about. We are also often told that it was not the largest banks that caused the crisis in the United States, but broker-dealers or monoline firms. In my opinion, such a statement ignores a great deal about commercial bank activities leading up to that crisis. In 1999, with the passage of what was known as the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act in the United States, commercial banks were formally permitted to expand into activities traditionally conducted by broker-dealers and they're able to do so without having to relinquish any of their access to the public safety net. This provided them a significant competitive advantage that cannot be overstated. U.S. broker-dealers could not successfully compete with complex banks that due to the safety net had almost unlimited access to low-cost funds 
and the ability to rely on extreme leverage to expand their balance sheets. Knowing this, investment houses opposed repeal of the, of the so-called Glass-Steagall Act, which separated commercial banking from investment broker-dealer activities when it was first discussed. They were adamantly opposed. Now, partly because they, they knew what would happen as a result. However, once the bill, once they were merged under the law and it was enacted, the competitive advantages that the safety net offered were so significant that firms outside the safety net were compelled to give with, get within it to survive. They gained access either by merging into a commercial bank or by increasing their risk profile using more volatile funding and increased leverage just as the commercial banks. And they began to get what was known as an implied safety net, too big to fail. Firms like Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, and Lehman Brothers chose the latter option in their ultimately failed effort to stay relevant. They issued significant amounts of short-term liabilities such as repos to fund longer term assets. And because financial regulations were changed to enable them to access short term sources of funds, they became commercial banks in practice, leveraging their balance sheets and intermediating short term liabilities and longer term assets. Given these structural changes, it should surprise no one that when the crisis occurred, it was necessary also to bail out these firms, greatly expanding the explicit use of the government safety net. So it went from implicit to explicit, as many in the market thought it would, and bet accordingly. If commercial banking and its safety net were unquestionably separated from investment and broker-dealer activities, independent broker-dealers would again compete for capital and business clients within an open market. Investment banks could provide non-subsidized underwriting, trading, and market-making services and these activities would be conducted with far fewer conflicts of interest than is currently being experienced. Prior to the ability of these two industries to merge, no market in the world was more innovative and competitive than that of the United States with its specialized loan and capitalized capital markets. Individual firms could succeed and they could fail and did without bringing the entire financial system down. It was, in practice, a financial model that provided better outcomes than we have experienced since that time, as witnessed recently. What about the broader banking industry in the United States and the so-called regulatory burden that seems to be growing by the day? Well, it's just a fact that following each crisis, new laws and regulation inevitably follow, and this most recent crisis is no exception. <laughs> The so-called Dodd-Frank Act in the United States subjects the banking industry to hundreds of pages of laws requiring thousands of pages of rules. And I'm involved in the writing of those rules, and it is thousands of pages of rules. These laws and regulations operate as a fixed cost for all financial firms. No matter the size of the firm, rules must be read and implemented. Staff must be trained, and lawyers must be consulted to assure proper compliance. As with any set of fixed costs, their averages decline as these costs are allocated over more assets. Thus, the advent of substantial new regulations with their high fixed costs encourage the process of consolidation as firms must manage costs down. So it becomes its own catalyst towards ever larger firms. As firms consolidate and some become too important to fail, they also receive an advantage to fund assets with far greater amounts of debt and at a lower cost than that available to other regional or community banks in the United States at least. For example, the leverage ratio, the ratio of tangible capital to total tangible assets for the eight largest banks in the U.S. at the end of the second quarter of 2013 was 4.3% using international accounting standards. This is approximately half the tangible capital to assets among other U.S. banks. And the sheet that has the yellow uh, columns uh, demonstrate that if you, uh, and you can look at it at your leisure, but it's pretty striking. In targeting a specific expected return on equity, ROE, therefore, the ability to hold half as much capital against the cost of deposits or borrowed funds results in significant pricing advantage in the composition for loans. Comparing ROEs among banks, it should surprise no one that the ROE for the largest banks in the U.S. at least 
even with their current issues of fines and penalties, is higher than banks not considered too big to fail. This disadvantage makes it proportionally more difficult to attract capital to banks not geared towards consolidation. So it becomes its own self-fulfilling prophecy. Thus, pulling back the safety net to commercial banking activities could have several beneficial effects for regional and smaller banks in the U.S. It would reduce the need for ever more complicated and burdensome regulation that raised the cost of doing business and encourage further industry consolidation. It would reduce the perception that some banks cannot be successfully allowed to fail, which enhances their access to lower cost of capital and provides them a competitive edge in pricing products. And finally, it returns to shareholder, the returns to shareholders would be determined by market performance and less by regulatory circumstance. What about the public? Well, that's the final area I want to talk about. Rationalizing the financial industry structure would serve the interests of the public, again, in my opinion. While industry structure would serve, <clears throat> while, while the safety net's extension to an ever wider array of activities, which encourages excessive leverage and unmanaged assets, played a central role in the last crisis. When the leverage boom ended at that period, and the world discovered that there wasn't enough bank capital to absorb unexpected losses, these large, complex, and highly leveraged firms brought our economic system to the brink of collapse globally. As a result, governments were required to commit trillions of dollars of public resources as they struggled to stabilize global banks and economies, and certainly I know you realize that. Even these efforts could not prevent the loss of millions of jobs and the onset of the Great Recession globally. The U.S. has a long history in which its financial structure included firms ranging from many large commercial banks to medium and small banks, and independent investment houses serving a broad range of customers with varying credit funding requirements. This decentralized structure contrasts with today's small number of large financial firms, which too often become single points of failure, as we recently experienced. In a private capital financial system, there always will be business cycles, business failures, and financial losses. When financial resources are concentrated in only a few protected firms, the impact of any one failure is almost necessarily systemic and sometimes, as we've seen, catastrophic. Rationalizing the structure won't end failure, nor should it, not in a capital system, but it will make failure more manageable and less likely to become catastrophic and that's in the public interest. Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations recognized this more than 200 years ago and argued, as many argue today, for a decentralized, less concentrated, and less government-dependent banking system. So let me conclude, and then I'll be happy to take questions or comments. In the quest to improve financial industry stability, behavior, and performance, it is unfortunate that we choose complicated administration over structural change. It is the financial structure that is inherently unstable, yet it remains mostly unchanged from that which existed prior to the crisis. It's even more concentrated. The safety net and its subsidy have expanded in scope, actually. Firms have grown larger and more complex. The issue of single point of failure and its effect on the economy has increased in prominence, and the competitive inequities that follow from these circumstances remains mostly unaddressed. We share a common goal, to have a system where financial firms are well run and successful, where the market and customers drive behavior and enhance performance, uh, and where financial returns are competitive, reliable, and therefore able to attract capital. In my opinion, it's time to change the current structure to achieve the common goal. So I will conclude with that, and now I'm happy to take questions or comments if you care to ask or change.